Hey everybody, before we get into this episode, I did want to let you know if you have not already gone and listened to the previous episode, um, I did a awesome interview with a local author, David Hanneken, and I am giving away one signed copy of his book. And that giveaway is going until, I believe I said, October 21st. So all you have to do to be entered to win is head over to my Facebook page or my Instagram, like the post, and then tag three friends or share the post, whichever one you would prefer to do. And then, so technically you could be entered twice to win this book. It's a pretty great book. I enjoyed it. Um, But yeah, so if you have not already checked out that interview, you should definitely go and do that. Um, But enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. This is Abby Alcox with Badgerland Journal, and I am back at you with another episode. Today, we have finally entered spooky season. (laughs) So we are officially in October, and to kind of honor the mm, creepy crawlies, spooky whatnot, you know, we gotta cover something kind of spooky in Wisconsin, because I mean, it is a Wisconsin history podcast after all. But today we are going to be talking about the Second Salem. So for those of you who are sitting here going, uh, we have no idea what city in Wisconsin is considered the Second Salem, don't worry, I'm here to tell you that it is in fact Whitewater, Wisconsin. And they have a couple of different things. There's some witches, there's some ghosts, there's even a little bit of murder mystery in there. Maybe just murder. We know what happens. At least after the fact. Anyways, so let's get into it. So really, Whitewater's reputation for being involved in the occult or the spooky starts with a man named Morris Pratt, and he ends up moving from New York to Wisconsin in 1840. In Madison, Wisconsin, he meets a well-known medium named Mary Haynes Chenoweth, and she gives him some advice and tells him, you need to invest your money in northern Wisconsin, and there you will make, make a profit. And so he does. He goes up and invests in the land, and he strikes gold, or iron specifically. But this iron ore company, he makes a bunch of money mining the ore out of the earth. And so he promises that he's going to reinvest his money into spiritualism. So mediums are connected to spiritualism, so that's why he's reinvesting in this uh, Mary Haynes Chenoweth. And so for those of you who are like, Abby, what the heck is spiritualism? Maybe it sounds vaguely familiar. I kind of know what a medium is. Don't worry. I got you. We're going to go over it. So modern spiritualism as we know it today was really started in 1848 with the Fox sisters. And I believe this was in New York, actually. But they moved into a supposedly haunted house with their family. And they would hear random ducking and some different noises. And so then Maggie and Kate, these two Fox sisters, um, began to try and clap their hands and snap their finger fingers, trying to communicate with the spirits that were in their house. And allegedly, or they claimed, the spirits would then communicate back with them. And so then they told everyone that the spirit was actually a murdered peddler whose remains was in their family cellar. And so this story obviously drew a lot of attention because everybody loves a ghost story. And so the spiritualist movement kind of began to grow in the United States. The idea that you could communicate with the dead and that there was a little bit of science. It wasn't just all purely faith. And in 1851, there was actually a little bit of an investigation into the girls. And they came out and said, it's very likely these girls are faking it. There is no spirit. They're making the noises. They're making up the story. And in actually in 1888, 
The sisters will come out and claim that they were indeed faking it. They were never communicating. But Maggie will recant that confession later and say, no, I truly do believe in it. I was just pressured into confessing it was faked. Because, you know, why would you stop at something that's making you money? You know, she's making a crap ton of money off of these seances and communicating with the dead. But despite this investigation saying they're likely faking it, in the 1860s and 70s, um, spiritualism was a huge thing. There's like spirit photography where you could like see the spirits behind you. You could go to lectures based on spirituality. You could go to a seance. Sometimes mediums would even have like ectoplasm coming out of them. And so it kind of has this reputation for being a little uh, kooky, which to be fair, there were a lot of people faking these and scamming people saying they were uh, talking to the dead. But there was actually some scientific methods behind this. They wanted to try and scientifically prove that yes, there is a afterlife. And so they're trying to actually support the idea of religious beliefs through these different seances. In 1930, it was estimated that 2,500,000 people were practicing spiritualism throughout the world. And it was actually backed by our favorite mystery detective, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, but you know who didn't believe in spiritualists? Harry Houdini, who was born in Appleton, Wisconsin. We might have to do a podcast on him at some point. But this is just kind of giving you the idea of what is spiritualism. It's not necessarily like witchcraft, but it's got like a spooky element to it. And so Morris Pratt, again, said he's going to reinvest in spiritualism, and he does this by building the Morris Pratt Institute in Whitewater, Wisconsin. So the building itself was built in 1888, and then it was opened to the public in 1889. This was the first and only spiritualist university in the country, so in the United States. And they would eventually have both normal college classes as well as classes dedicated specifically to spiritualism, mediumships, and seances. So Pratt called it his temple of science. The people who were local to Whitewater just called it the spook temple. They did not understand the spiritualism. And like I said, they thought it was witchcraft. This institute operated in Whitewater until 1946, when it was shut down and moved to the Milwaukee area. I saw that it was either West Allis or Wauwatosa. Uh, I guess I could do more research into it, but I didn't really care that much. But if you are interested in taking any of those classes, it still exists. Go sign up. Um, the building itself was turned into a telephone office before it was torn down. The building was demolished in 1961. You are no longer able to visit the original location of the Morse Pratt Institute. But that leads us into our next kind of spooky phenomenon, which is the Witch's Triangle, which is connected back to the Morse Pratt Institute. So don't you worry. It'll come around as we go through these stories, except maybe the murder. The murder is just a little bit unrelated, but, you know, like I said, I thought I'd murder mystery, spookiness, throw that in there. So the Witch's Triangle is a supernatural vortex that is created due to the fact that Whitewater has three cemeteries that when you map them out, they create an isosceles triangle, which means two sides are the equal distance apart. Although I am wondering where they're like measuring from, like is it to the entrance to the entrance or is it like the middle of the cemetery i'm actually interested like how exact are we getting on these uh equal distances apart but irrelevant so the legend is that oak grove cemetery is the cemetery where a witch's temple used to be located and supposedly the coven and their witch's altar is still buried there which causes supernatural activity the other two cemeteries are Hillside and Calver Calvary Cemetery, and they make up the triangle. And here's how the Morse Pratt Institute comes back into it, because it is supposed to be exactly in the middle of this triangle. 
coincidence? Maybe. Supernatural? Maybe. And Morris Pratt himself is buried at Hillside Cemetery in Whitewater. There is this legend of a Mary Worth, who is either a axe-murdering woman, or a witch, or both, who haunts one of the three cemeteries, depending on whose story you are following. And she will rise on Halloween and start looking for a new victim to take. There is also supposedly a coffin of a little girl that showed up on Whitewater's campus in 1970 during Halloween. And this is believed to have come from one of the cemeteries. I'm kind of hoping that someone just made a prank box because if you dug up a coffin and put it on the or put it on the campus grounds, that is kind of a jerk mood. You know, what did that little girl do? You know, she already died at a young age and now you're digging up her coffin? Just rude. Root. Anyways, more spookiness that comes from this ghost triangle. Oh, I forgot to mention, anything in the triangle, including UW-Whitewater and its campus and dorms, uh, is considered haunted. So anything within that triangle, fair, fair grounds or fair play for haunting of all of the ghosts of Whitewater. Which is why we're going to now talk about the Alpha Sigma sorority from Whitewater and their house that is off of campus. It used to be an old mansion. And they heard something coming from the basement in 1981 while they were eating dinner. So they went downstairs to investigate and there were bricks thrown all over the place and a tunnel entrance was now exposed that the bricks were scattered about. And this tunnel actually connected to other buildings on Main Street. They say that the tunnel system was used by witches to be avoid to avoid being seen by citizens. Or alternatively, a lot of these sorority houses are old mansions and they had tunnels connecting to other buildings. I saw something that mentioned that it's possible that it was used in the Underground Railroad. I'm a little skeptical just because Wisconsin wasn't even really a state until 1848. I don't think Whitewater was founded uh, much long after that. Uh, it would seem odd to me. Plus, it's kind of just normal for some of these older towns to have tunnels connecting the buildings on the main street. That's actually not that odd. So I'm skeptical on that. Um, but, you know, if you want to believe the spooky, it was a witch's tunnel. They were using those to sneak around and do their witchcraft without being seen. And one final, you know, which is triangle possible causes coming outness uh, is the Green Hill Center of the Arts. They have claimed to have seen like poltergeist activities, so ghosts moving objects, um, sinister shadows, invisible hands touching or pushing. Um, I'm not saying I would want to hang out there. I'm also not. All right, so I'm going to tell you the facts. These are all like stories, things that get told. There's not a ton of proof to go behind them, so I can't consider them necessarily history other than they are stories. And stories are a part of our history. They just may not be factually correct. I'm also not going to say that ghosts don't exist. Um, I'm skeptical, but I also think that... Uh, I think it would be naive to claim that there's absolutely no way ghosts exist. So I'm I'm skeptical, but likely. And if you talk to my dad's side of the family, they all believe in ghosts because their house was haunted while growing up. Anyways, so moving on. We now have the Witch's Tower. Yes, we moved from the Witch's Triangle to the Witch's Tower. And so there is a stone water tower on UW-Whitewater's campus. And it's supposed to be where the witches would carry out their black masses. And that's why it's nicknamed the Witch's Tower. There's also stories that they summoned lake monsters or evil entities that um, witches would use to call on their power. So this water tower is located in Starin Park. And people have claimed to, to this day to still have seen which is surrounding the tower, performing rituals. And what's really backed up by this is, is the gate that surrounds the tower 
at least it was. I think someone finally fixed it. The spikes or the barbed wire that went around the top of the gate to keep people from jumping over it was pointed inwards. And so it was kind of this idea that the gate was trying to keep something in, not trying to keep people out. Like I said, I think it's now been fixed, but that was kind of the legend for a while. Um, in all reality, someone probably just put up the gate wrong, and then now it's been remedied. But you also have the haunting of Wells Hall, which is very close to this water tower. It was built in the 1960s, and since it was built, there has been different hauntings in the dorm ever since. In 1992, a student saw a witch, ri a witch ritual occurring on the beach of Whitewater Lake, and then claimed to have seen a large object emerging from the water, so possibly that lake monster I was talking about earlier. Once again, these stories are undocumented, they are vague, there's no proof, but... It's still a fun story to talk about. And moving on, we now have the witch's book. Yes, there's a book involved. So the witch's book is supposedly kept um, away from the public in Anderson Library. And the tome is supposedly written by Morris Pratt Institute attendees. So remember the people who they thought were witches. They're the ones who supposedly wrote this book. I'm going to say supposedly because the book doesn't really exist. But those who are said to have read the book either commit suicide or go mentally, ex go mentally insane. Students are told that if they ask to see the book or ask about the book, they will be expelled. Now, do I believe this is true? No. But do I believe that a librarian who is sick of having students come up to her and ask if to see this witch's book got sick of it and told them they'd be expelled if they asked her? Yes. Yes, I do. Because librarians are smart like that. Never underestimate your librarian. It is believed to have driven three students and a professor to kill themselves. That's the death record of this fictitious book. Because when interviewed about this the head archivist talked about the only locked book is the a Catholic hymnal book that they really don't have any information on. So honestly, is anyone coming and looking for a book that they can't identify? She believed that the story likely came around 1989, which would be over 100 years after the, not over, exactly 100 years after the Morris Pratt Institution was built. Um, the archives actually had all of their books stored in, ca in a cage because that was the only storage unit available to them, so they possibly stirred these rumors of this book being under lock and key. So I have just told you a bunch of stories that are unverified, possibly never happened. Um, so I want to leave you with one spooky, creepy, I don't know how creepy it is, but it's a murder. We love murder and terror. So I'm going to tell you about that. This did happen. There is evidence that it occurred. Um, so we're going to talk about the poison widow that was from Whitewater. Our story starts with Myrtle Shod and her husband, Edward Shod. And they had four children together and they lived on a farm. Supposedly, the farm existed on the grounds of one of the three cemeteries that makes up the uh, witch's triangle. I don't really believe that one. I think that's just someone trying to connect the spookiness back to this murder. Um, but they would take in lodgers from the university into their house, and this is because at the time, dorms were not a thing. One of the lodgers that they took in was named Ernst Kufel. And he will have claimed to have fallen in love with Mrs. Shod at first sight. And this is according to the other lodger that they took in, Brett Schneider. And so, March 18th, 1922, you have the death of Edward Shawde. And he was already sick. He was reported to have jaundice. And it seemed he was getting better. But then he died unexpectedly. And so they reported this as natural causes. He was already sick, you know. People sometimes seem like they're getting better and then and then die. 
And so sh- Mrs. Shawde, or Myrtle, we'll call her Myrtle. I feel like we're on a first name basis for this woman that, you know, is not alive any longer. Anyways, she then sells their property and she opens up a boarding house for the girls at the school. So kind of taking in those borders again. And she continues to main cor- maintain correspondence with Ernst. And so, you know, maybe they're a little bit closer than they should be, but, you know, people die, it's fine, nothing is arise here yet. But then on September 21st, 1923, she goes and she purchases some strychnine, which if you don't know, is poison. In addition to this poison, she also buys candy that she puts puts the poison into. Then she is driving with her children. She's going to send them out to the countryside. And before they go, she hands each of her children a piece of candy. Her oldest child takes a bite and spits it out, saying it has a bitter taste. She then tells all of the children to spit out the candy. And she begins to wipe their mouths out. And she claims that she bought this candy from a very strange lady. And she thought that they might be poisoned and she wants them to come with her back to the doctor and have them checked out. Her oldest says, no, it's just some weird candy, whatever. We're going to go go to the countryside. I think they were buying potatoes. So they leave. And then the Mrs. Shod then drives back into town or walks back into town. And she tells her neighbor the same story about this weird lady who she bought candy from, gave it to her kids. She's worried it's poisoned. Probably trying to set her alibi here in case the kids don't do okay. But now they've gone off into the country and she's worried. So the neighbor then goes and asks a professor to go and find the children. And by the time he's getting ready to leave, the children are actually headed back. The eldest had had some side effects from the poison, but the other children were able to take the wheel because he was driving at the time driving back they were taken to the doctor nobody sustained any prolonged effects from the poison however now people are questioning that's weird you know it's weird if you give your kids some candy and then it has strychnine in it and you had bought strychnine uh just a few days earlier it's not a good look you know if you're gonna murder someone which i'm not endorsing it's not a good look like if you're gonna buy the poison buy it ahead of time don't do not do it within the same time period. Anywho. So, obviously, she's brought into custody. Um, they have some questions for her. And she actually then signs a confession about the poisoning of both her children and her husband. Yes, that, that death I mentioned earlier that just seemed to be natural causes was not natural causes. Then, while she is in prison or in jail awaiting her trial, she has a mental breakdown. And when she comes out of this breakdown and kind of seems to be a little bit more lucid, she claims that Ernst helped to mix the poison in her husband's drink. So yes, that border that claimed to have fallen in love with her, that they seemed a little bit too close, um, she's claiming he had helped her poison her husband. So they are then going to go to him. He swears he knew nothing. I don't know what she's talking about. Clearly she's crazy. Don't listen to her. Listen to me. I am this, you know, tall, handsome young man. He was a World War II vet. And so he's charged anyways. They still think he's involved. And so then the affair comes out through their letters, which is very incriminating. They were writing love letters to each other. Um, The letters mention how he wants to marry her. But then there's also the issue of the children. He wasn't sure how, you know, they would react to being in this family or would he be able to provide for four children? You know, he loves Myrtle, but he's not sure, you know, he loves his children, which, you know, for any mother should be a deal breaker. If a man ain't going to love your children, he ain't the man for you. Anyways, in one letter, he even insinuates that they should take care of the children like they did the mister. Seems, seems pretty, pretty uh, incriminating. Ernst comes in. And like I said, he looks very confident. He's a World War II vet, handsome. 
And Myrtle at this point is looking very weak, very fragile. She just had a mental breakdown. So his word against her word, how it plays out, he gets acquitted. He is not charged with any of the poisoning. She, on the other hand, pleads guilty to five poisoning charges. And she is sentenced to 20 years in prison. How this works out is you had 10 years for the husband and 10 years for each child. But the child's sentences could be or the charges for the children being poisoned could be served con- like concurrently, concurrently. I can speak. I don't have issues with words. You all know that's a lie, but it's fine. But basically, it comes out to 20 years. And this was actually a huge trial. It made the news from like all over the country, New York, St. Louis, you know. It wasn't just a Wisconsin thing. This was national news. So now that she has pled guilty, she is serving her sentence, she suffers another mental breakdown in prison, and her mental state starts to deteriorate. Um, So she applies for a pardon, and it is rejected the first two times, and this is uh, in coordination with her children who are trying to get her out. And the Next time she applied for a pardon, she had a endorsement from the doctor who was saying if she stays in prison for any longer, then she is not going to be able to leave. She's, you know, her mental state will be beyond, be beyond repair. So in January of 1929, she will receive a pardon. And she is a free woman, gets to go live with her kids. I believe she actually goes and moves to... Illinois after this. But that is the real life poison widow that was in Whitewater, Wisconsin. So that's all my spooky, creepy Halloween ish that I have from Whitewater, at least. Um, Whether or not you think it is the second Salem is up to you. I'm more leaning towards no. There was really no evidence of witches being there. There's lots of stories of witches being there. And there are lots of stories. My cousin Reagan is going to Whitewater and she was telling me how there are still plenty of stories about the hauntedness of Whitewater going around. So it's up to you. But if you're ever around, they do have a Second Salem Brewing where you can go and get some spooky brews. So if you're in Whitewater, you should check that out. I have not been there yet. I, if I ever am, I'm going to go get some beer because I'm from Wisconsin and that's how we roll. Anyways, I would love to hear what you guys think. Do you think Whitewater is haunted? Do you not? Do you have any ghost stories you want to share with me? Um, You can let me know in addition to like any other spooky stories you want me to cover. Like I know there's a lot going on in Wisconsin when it comes to the spook. So let me know your ideas and you can do so by... By liking our Facebook page, which is Badgerland Journal Stories of Wisconsin. You could also leave a comment on our Instagram, which is at Badgerland Journal. Or you can send me a Gmail at BadgerlandJournal at gmail.com. Until next time, guys, keep it spooky.